They had it all, money, good educations, a home in Beverly Hills. And then one night, they shot their parents. My brother got there first, and just, we just burst through the doors. And uh, I started firing. What uh, Eric told Dr. Ozeal was the, the truly alarming thing is that after firing eight shots into the mother, they, they ran out of ammunition and she was still not dead. So they had to go outside, the two brothers, and Eric handed Lyle more ammunition for him to refill his 12-gauge shotgun. According to Eric and Lyle Menendez, they killed their parents out of fear. This is their official version. I just told them that I didn't want to do this, and that it hurt me. And he said that he didn't mean to hurt me, and he loved me. The two primary witnesses are no longer with us. The very people who could give testimony concerning what the brothers did on that evening were the very people, of course, whom the brothers killed. And so the trial uh, became not one so much of what the brothers did, when they did it, and how they did it, although there was emphasis placed on that, but it became a question of why they did it, the motivation. This isn't a television movie. There's real blood on their hands. And you're about to hear tapes that seem to contradict their claims of abuse. Great father. He was, he was there when I needed him. The time I had a problem, he was there. That's Eric Menendez describing his father before he was arrested for killing his mother and his father, before he claimed his father had sexually abused him. The first trial of Eric and Lyle Menendez ended in a hung jury. The L.A. prosecutors brought a second trial. The boys would tell their story again, tears and all. But this time, the jury rejected their abuse defense, and new law was made by the criminal behavior. Did they conspire to invent the abuse excuse? You decide. I just told him that I didn't want to do this, and that it hurt me, and he said that he didn't mean to hurt me, and he loved me. We all saw it on television, one of Hollywood's biggest rated shows, only it wasn't a show. It was two sons, describing how they killed their parents. My brother got there first, and... Just, we just burst through the doors, and uh, I started firing. There was things shattering, and the noise was phenomenal. And um, we fired lots of, you know, many, many times. You reloaded? Is that yes? Yes. And what did you do after you reloaded? I ran around and shot my mom. It was a crime that sent shockwaves beyond Los Angeles. Two young men brought up in ease, given every advantage in life, brutally murder their own mother and father as they sit quietly watching television. Worst of all was the motive. Prosecutors said they killed simply for the money. The Menendez brothers couldn't wait for their parents to die to inherit their millions. But the defense said there was more to it than that that the Menendez brothers were the victims of sexual abuse, and they killed in self-defense. Others see a conspiracy. Did they concoct their tale of abuse? The prosecution begins with a police tape, the 911 telephone call made moments after the killings. What's the problem? What's the problem? I'm sorry to kill my parents. Pardon me? Sorry to kill my parents. What? Who? Are they still there? Yes. The people? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> were they shot? Hey, man, they... Uh, were they shot? Yes. They were shot? Yes. <laughs> 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 
For the outside world, this is how the story began. A call to 911. A report the two people lay brutally murdered. The call from one of their own sons. They asked you a number of questions, and when they asked you those questions, you were crying, correct? Right. And at the same time, you were lying while you were crying. Is that correct? Right. Later, a tape came in uh, made by the psychologist, Dr. Uh, uh, Jerome Ozeal, and in the tape, we hear the voices of the two uh, brothers, but specifically Lyle, describing killing the uh, mother. And uh, his version is that the mother was so, he didn't look upon it as murder, that the mother was so unhappy and uh, because of the father's being unfaithful to her and that she was suicidal and they looked on it as sort of doing her a favor. But what they, what uh, Eric told Dr. Ozeal was the, the truly alarming thing is that after firing eight shots into the mother, they, they ran out of ammunition and she was still not dead. So they had to go outside, the two brothers, and Eric handed Lyle more ammunition for him to refill his 12-gauge shotgun. On the night uh, they killed their parents, Eric Menendez was sobbing on the front lawn, rolled up in a fetal position, sobbing uncontrollably, uh, hysterical, out of control. And I've spoken to psychologists who have told me that that emotion was, was genuine, that, that, that you could actually kill your parents and then return an hour later and realize what you've done and express genuine emotion, because many neighbors told me that, that, that he was not faking that emotion. All of the horror of the scene is in the voice of Lyle Menendez, but what the tape doesn't tell us is that every word is a lie. Listen again. How could they have faked this emotion? Who is the person that was shot? My mom and my dad. Your mom and dad? My mom and my dad. <laughs> Robert Rand is a friend of Lyle and Eric Menendez. He attended every day of the trial. Going into this trial, uh, the prosecutors thought they had a slam dunk case. You know, they, it, was, it was quite clear that the brothers had, had killed their parents and they were going to prove that. And also, they had several motives that they were going to prove. They uh, originally had said that Eric and Lyle Menendez killed uh, out of greed. They wanted their parents' money. They were in a hurry to inherit the uh, millions of dollars Jose Menendez had made during his life. And during the trial, that, uh, the motive, the focus of the prosecution's motive changed to uh, hatred. And they said that uh, Eric and Lyle Menendez had killed uh, out of hatred, that they, uh, they hated their parents and, their, and the way that their parents controlled their lives, and, and that was the motive. And then at the very end, in one of the closing arguments, uh, Deputy District Attorney Lester Curiama suggested that perhaps the reason the brothers had killed was that Jose Menendez had found out that uh, Eric was gay, and that that was the family secret, and that was the motivation for the killing. I believe these prosecutors kept throwing different motives against the wall, hoping something would stick and nothing did with most of the jurors. Dominic Dunn, a writer, he too was there for the trial. The audacity of the uh, defense uh, strategy that I think has absolutely fascinated people. Uh, the defense did not make their strategy known until 10 days before the trial started. And what seemed to be an open and shut case of premeditated first degree murder then became something else entirely. And uh, in the, the Menendez brothers, they had two uh, defendants who um, attracted personally a lot of attention. I mean, the fact that they were young, that they were good looking, that they were heirs to a great fortune, et cetera, et cetera, added to the glamour of these guys. We went back into the archives. We listened to the tapes, the story of the Menendez family. Where does the truth lie? 
The facts are simple. Jose Menendez, an immigrant to this country, works his way up the corporate ladder, becomes a millionaire in the movie business. He moves into a mansion in Beverly Hills with his wife and their two sons. On August 20th, 1989, Jose and Kitty Menendez are slain by the two sons they brought into the world. The police questioned Jose's sons that night, questioned and released them. Their story was so convincing. They were uh, questioned separately, neither heard what the other one said. And their stories were so convincing that he did not ask them to take the paraffin test. If that had happened, they would have been arrested that night, not seven months later. Right from the start, the brothers shifted suspicion elsewhere. At first, they tried to blame the mafia. They fooled everybody, including hard-boiled, seen-it-all crime reporters like Steve Dunleavy. I'll never forget when that story first came out. There they do. They make their 911 call. They blamed the mafia. Right up until the moment that they went out and bought themselves a Porsche and a couple of Rolex watches, and then uh, went on vacations and went on a spending spree. What we have here was a fact that Menendez Sr., indeed, I would guess, a fairly ambitious, pushy, if you will, father, no question about that, a very, very successful Cuban, and we all know that the Cuban community, extremely hard workers, driven, they gave their kids the best of everything. And there was no question that those kids, those boys, as their term, those boys were going to inherit everything. They just were impatient. Impatient in the most blind, evil, blackest, monstrous way. Then came the eulogy. With his parents' bodies barely cold, Lyle stood up at the memorial service in Hollywood and delivered a moving, tearful eulogy. What he didn't tell the audience of his parents, friends, and relatives was that he was the killer. There were two funeral services. And before the first of the two, uh, there actually there were memorial services. One was held at the Directors Guild in Hollywood. The other was held at Princeton University at the chapel at, uh, at Princeton where Lyle had gone and where the family had once uh, lived. And uh, before the first of the two, they went for their first shopping uh, spree, which is what it turned out to be, and they bought $15,000 worth of Rolex watches, uh, which they wore to the uh, funeral, uh, to the first um, memorial, I should keep saying. And uh, then afterwards, uh, uh, they um, went on a spending spree, and in the m few months afterwards, they spent $700,000. Uh, that's a lot of bucks to spend very, very quickly. And it always makes me think that they're a combination, these guys, of incredibly smart and incredibly stupid. One of the first things they asked me when I sat down to talk with them was if I might be interested in writing a book with them about their father. Bob Rand, he's one of a handful of journalists who've ever interviewed the Menendez brothers. He spoke to them right after the murders, before they were suspects. I've never seen anything like it. Uh, never will see anything like it. Probably the hardest thing I'll probably ever have to. They weren't real. They didn't look real. Yeah. They, they wax. They looked like yeah. wax. It was just, it's something that I've never seen my dad help us. You know, I think that possibly if Lau and I would have been home, we would have been able to do something about it, maybe. Uh, maybe my dad would be alive. Um, I definitely would give my life for my dad's. Then Eric told Rand how great their father was, how one day they believed he would go back to Miami and he would run for the Senate. No talk of abuse in this interview, no hint of the horror in the house on Elm Drive, just the fantasy of a happy family. He was a great father. He was, he was there when I needed him. Anytime I had a problem, he was there. He was immediately taken off work, and he was there. Anytime I was at a tennis match, he was there. 
where they thought he was such an extraordinary man that they thought he should be memorialized in, in a book. Uh, I'm a writer. I write, but I, I, not, right. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't write. I wrote my first book when I was sixth grade, but I don't write uh, novels. I've never had uh, mm -hmm. something like this. My father would want to be done well mm -hmm. and could be you know, an incredible bestseller and I wanted to because I want my father to be known. Because he, I mean, I feel a loss. Or I compare him, when I talk about my friends, to Kennedy. I'm not going to live my life with my father, but I think his, his dreams or his ambitions and, and, and are, are what I absolutely want to But, you know, it's something that, that I feel that he's, he's in me and he's pushing me uh, further and further. Uh, but they were very sincere over the course of three days that we talked in the fall of 1989 about uh, how much they loved their parents and what a great loss it was. Apparently um, sincere, but they were lying to you. That's right. They were lying to me. Then, in a strange twist of fate, seven months after they killed their parents, they were arrested. On March 6th of 1990, a woman named Judalon Smith called up the Beverly Hills Police and said she had some information about the murders of Jose and Kitty Menendez. She said that her boyfriend, a therapist who had been treating the brothers, had uh, heard their confession to the murder of their parents. They were arrested for murder. Still, not a hint of what was to come. Then, with the trial only days away and the brothers facing the gas chamber, they announced to the world that they had been victims of sexual abuse by their father since childhood. They said they killed in self-defense. As the world watched, Lyle Menendez took the witness stand. Did you and your brother kill your mother and father? Yes. Did you kill them for money? <coughs> Did no. Did you kill them because you wanted to pay them back for the way they had treated you? No. Why did you kill your parents? Because we were afraid. He would guide me, all my movements, and I would um, uh, have oral sex with him. He would break me. Did you cry? Yes. Did you ask him not to? Yes. How did you ask him not to? I just told him, I don't, I don't. <laughs> I just told him that I didn't want to do this. And that it hurt me. And he said that he didn't mean to hurt me. And he loved me. He was so brilliant in the um, performance that he did on the, on the stand, the weeping, uh, the, the saying that his father raped him when he was six years old and so forth that as cynical as I am about this uh, defense that they have uh, taken, I momentarily uh, was captivated by him and touched by him. What did you say to your mom? I told her to tell Dad to leave me alone. And he keeps touching me. She told me to stop it and that I was exaggerating and that my dad has to punish me when I do things wrong. Sometimes she would rub my face in the sheets. She'd refuse to change the sheets. I'd sleep on the floor. Sometimes, did you touch your mom? Yes. And where would you touch her? Um, uh, everywhere. He just kept um, exposing herself. Picking me up in, at the clubs with, you know, in a robe, exposed. You see, molestation is not grounds for murder. Imminent danger is. So that, and on top of the abuse excuse, they had to, uh, to uh, add that they were in imminent danger of their own lives. And they claimed that their parents were about to kill them. 
Now the fact remains that the parents each had a rifle and that the, the two rifles, the mother and father's rifle, were upstairs in the dressing room, in the closet of the, of the mother's uh, dressing room. And I mean, they could have just gone in and looked at those rifles and knew they were, they were still there, but they, said, but they didn't do that. And they were convinced, they say, that the parents were going to kill them. And the fact that the parents went into the den or the family room and closed the door behind them made the boys positive that the parents were about to kill them. Uh, that sort of reasoning I find very difficult to follow. Law professor Robert Pugsley picks up the story. The thing about the uh, Menendez case is that, of course, the two primary witnesses are no longer with us. The very people who could give testimony concerning what the brothers did on that evening were the very people, of course, whom the brothers killed. And so the trial uh, became not one so much of what the brothers did, when they did it, and how they did it, although there was emphasis placed on that, but it became a question of why they did it, the motivation. Normally, I want to stress, that is reserved for the sentencing phase of a trial. The why is typically irrelevant in deciding guilt or innocence in the first place. It comes into play when you're deciding how harsh a penalty to impose. But they made the entire trial through the skill of Leslie Abramson uh, and um, Jill Lansing, the two co-counsel, for, co counsel for each of the two brothers, they turned the bulk of the trial into the why question, and that's what really diverted the jurors' attention. The brothers had now completely abandoned the lie that the mafia killed their parents. They now admitted they bought shotguns two days in advance. They ambushed their parents as they ate ice cream and watched television. They admitted that they blew their parents' heads off in a wild orgy of violence. Now they had a news story. Their father had sexually abused them for years and planned to kill them that night. If your mother had lived, she could have been a witness against you. Objection, or calls for speculation. Overall. Uh, no, I, I doubt she would have been a, uh, a witness against us at any point. I, I think that she might very well have killed us. In fact, the only person that could uh, deny or contest your claim is your father, correct? Uh, my father and my mother. And both of them are dead, correct? Uh, yes. You and I will see in subsequent days of trial on court TV, on the networks, on my show, on your show, we will see them going through the crying game once again. Oh, they did a brilliant job. Cried on cue. You don't buy it. I don't buy the tears, the troubles, the tribulations, and from my point of view, as a consumer, not as a reporter, a pack of lies. There are no witnesses who ever saw any, any molestation. However, typically in, in a case of sexual molestation involving uh, parents and, and a child, there never are any witnesses. There are no videotapes. So it's really just one person's word. And Jose and Kitty Menendez are not here to defend themselves. So it's the brothers. Why did this story about child molestation come out two years after they've admitted to this massacre? to this gory, gory, filthy crime against their parents. Why? Why now? What, did they both sort of have attacks of amnesia as they're in jail? Is there a, was there a problem between the first time they admitted to the cops what they did? Why now? Now, as far as their legal defense, brilliant. Brilliant. And that is indeed, according to the law, that's what the lawyers are there for, to give them the, pos the best possible defense. And they have. There's no question. Those lawyers are brilliant. And they are part of the system. And we are part of the system that makes sure that they get their best possible defense. And I can't argue with that. I can't argue with the lawyers. They've done a brilliant job. Liars? Yes. I'd say those little boys, bracket, monsters, unbracket, are liars.
Leslie wrapped her client, Eric, in the cloak of battered children everywhere. Nobody would deny that this country has a vast and troubling problem with battered children. It's inexcusable. But the resources that should be directed on that are legislative, health and safety resources, police resources, investigative resources. It's not at all clear to me that Eric Menendez is representative of the battered children of America. I do not identify him as their leader. And so I reject her contention in that respect. The key, the pivotal move in this trial was when Leslie Abramson, using the so-called imperfect self-defense voluntary manslaughter doctrine, which is where the defendant in fact but unreasonably believes that his life is in danger, gets to present that evidence to the, uh, to the court. And specifically the evidence that he wanted to present and his brother Lyle in support of that claim had to do with their uh, years and years of abuse at the hands of the parents, alleged abuse. So it was an interesting thing. We have a doctrine called imperfect self-defense. It's established in California law. It usually arises where somebody is coming at you. Why was this story never mentioned, even to their own psychiatrist? Where did it come from? Some in the court believe the brothers invented the story. Robert Pugsley, the criminal law expert. This is right out of the pages of a book called When a Child Kills by Paul Menez, who's a nationally recognized authority on parasite cases. Now the book is a fascinating book. I have, I have read it, in fact, I read it before this um, uh, trial. And I happen also to be a friend of Paul Monis's and uh, whom I like, although I disagree with. And the book is, in fact, a blueprint for a parasite uh, defense. I mean, um, and it's alarming how many things in this book appeared in this um, uh, a trial. And uh, I know for a fact from a uh, Menendez relative, very close to the family, that each brother read the book in jail. I know this also from a prisoner who had a cell next to Lyle for quite some time, who came to see me after he got out of uh, jail. And uh, I think that was the beginning of this concoction. There's a lot of suggestion that there was um, communication, not only with the attorneys, but among themselves and with third parties to construct this story. So I think there's good reason to be skeptical. They concocted an elaborate telephone uh, system, which the police in the jail were not aware of. Each brother at the same time at night called a different house in the 818 area code and with belonging to two people who were not related to the family. And the calls were then patched through to each other. They were a collect call to the 818 number and then patched through. So the only record is of the collect call, not of, of the patch through. I believe Eric and Lyle Menendez are telling the truth, that their story of molestation is genuine. I've interviewed over 400 people in the course of my four and a half years of research on this story, and I have other independent corroboration outside of uh, the trial testimony that supports their stories. Bob Rand did discover one other person who said Lyle Menendez had talked about sexual abuse before he was arrested, Donovan Goudreau. He was a roommate of Lyle's at Princeton. In a taped interview that's never been heard before, Goudreau tells Rand about the conversations. That one person who would know something uh, isn't here to defend himself. No, you see, the reason he told me that, he did tell me a lot of things about, you know, his father's stuff and that. But it's like, but I always thought he was doing it to lure me into maybe believing his objective, you know. But he never told me why he was doing it, why he was telling me. It didn't make sense until afterwards. You know what I'm saying? He told me a lot about their past and stuff. And, you know, it, it was similar to my past. I, I mm -hmm. was a molested as a child, and I told him that, and I guess that opened the gate, and he told me, and it was like, wow. Wow, and his brother were molested. The trouble is, when Goudreau took the witness stand, he denied the conversation ever took place. When a tape was played for him, he said he still didn't remember. So you still have no memory of that conversation with Mr. Rand? No, I don't. 
Are you saying that that conversation never took place? No, it obviously took place. I just don't remember the conversation. Do you recognize your voice? Yes, I do. That is your voice? Yes, it is. Four days later, in a hearing outside of the presence of the jury, uh, Jill Lansing, Lyle Menendez's attorney, questioned Donovan about the conversation with Lyle at the Chinese restaurant. And when she asked Donovan the question, uh, uh, in the course of the questioning, uh, Jill asked about the conversation at the Chinese restaurant. And when she asked uh, about what was Lyle's reaction after you told him you had been molested, Donovan Goudreau said on the witness stand, nothing. And Jill Lansing turned very pale. She was shocked because she knew about uh, this conversation uh, from several sources, including myself. And, uh, but Mr. Goudreau uh, denied that he had ever had that conversation with Lyle Menendez. That evening, on the advice of an attorney, I went to one of the local Los Angeles television stations with the audio tape interview I had recorded in March of 1992. And I played a portion of that tape uh, for the uh, newscast, uh, in effect publishing the information. Uh, the next morning, uh, the defense attorneys had videotaped the newscast, and they brought the uh, air check of the newscast into the courtroom. They confronted Donovan Goudreau on the witness stand, and they asked him if uh, hearing this tape refreshed his memory. And he admitted that that was his voice on the tape, but he didn't recall ever having that conversation with me. Uh, even though he and I had discussed this topic uh, a number of other times in, in the course of our uh, relationship uh, over the three years before the trial. After months of trial and weeks of deliberation, both juries wound up deadlocked. The state immediately vowed to prosecute again. You almost got away with it, didn't you? Yeah, you characterize it that way, and you think it's funny. But my brother and my life were, was very miserable for six months before we got arrested. And obviously wasn't better after we got arrested, and it isn't good now. And it never really has been great. You know, in some ways, getting arrested for my brother in some ways was a relief, and, and the changes that have happened are a relief, and I don't know what's going to happen at the end of this case, and we may go off to prison very likely. They've gotten away with murder. Round one, they won. They won big. And let me mention something. Leslie Abramson, as you probably know, is now out sending letters out to uh, at least 3,000 self-identified supporters who during the course of the proceedings wrote in letters of support for the brothers. And she's making basically a private appeal for funds to supplement the, uh, the defense on the retrial. And uh, I've really got to wonder who has that kind of motivation, understanding, and money and in a depressed economy to send to the, the uh, Eric Menendez Defense Fund. A triumphant Leslie Abramson, who rode Eric Menendez's defense to national fame, faced reporters outside the courtroom. Is it a victory? No, I don't consider it a victory. A victory would be if my client were free. To me, that would be a victory. This is unfortunately now a very expensive learning experience. There's part of the story we still don't know yet. There's a beat missing. I mean, I, I don't believe uh, that although greed may have had something to do with it, I don't go along with the uh, uh, prosecution stand that they killed for uh, money alone. Uh, something, they sure hated the parents. I mean, you can't do that to your parents without uh, hating them. Uh, I, I just feel that there was some sign, some, uh, some terrible fight had taken place in it. I, I don't know what that is, and only those two brothers know. I doubt if Leslie Abramson knows. Uh, you know, I feel the more, the more I heard that, that it could possibly have something to do with the fact that Eric, the younger son, uh, could possibly be gay. That certainly has been hinted at all through the um, uh, trial. This would have been an enormous problem for uh, Jose Menendez, who was known to be homophobic. Hard cases make bad law. That's a legal cliche, but it applies to this particular case. I don't think we saw anything resembling justice done round one. I hope round two, whatever the outcome, that at least the jurors will m arrive at their conclusion based on more restrictive and legally relevant information rather than the kind of psychoanalytic pop psychology stuff that is the fodder of everyday shows like uh, Oprah and Donahue. Jose came here from Cuba, started out as a dishwasher, turned himself into a millionaire in the movie business. 
no matter what may have happened in his house over the years, even if some or all of the abuse the brothers now talk about actually happened, the way it ended is staggering. The Menendez defense, it's been called the abuse excuse by courtroom observers. Will this case set a precedent? Robert Pugsley, who followed the trial closely, says that the defense has been used for years by battered women who kill their husbands, and that combined with this book helped the brothers get away with murder. They were taking the basic structure of the battered woman syndrome defense as it's evolved over 15 years. They were taking Mr. Menez's work, which focuses exclusively on children, and they were saying to the court, in effect, all of this does and should apply here and all this evidence should be admissible to demonstrate why the brothers, although at the precise moment they killed their parents, were in no threat of danger, felt that they were, went into the, uh, the den, the TV room where the parents were watching the tube and eating ice cream, and blew them away. It was like a, 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 a script. It started out this way. There was a fight, an argument, between the mother, Kitty, and um, Lyle over what we never heard. And in the course of the argument, Kitty Menendez leaned over and pulled the wig or the hairpiece off Lyle, which was the big shock that this 21-year-old guy, 21 at the time of the, of the uh, killings, uh, had, uh, was wearing a rug. And where, where this story went wrong is that the brother, Eric, claimed never to have known his brother wore a rug until the moment that the mother pulled the rug off the top of his, of his I mean, please. And uh, impossible, impossible that one brother doesn't know the other. I mean, the guy's getting bald and he's got a full head of hair and the, the, he didn't happen to notice it. And, uh, uh, and, but by seeing Lyle's embarrassment at the discovery that he was bald, it gave Eric the opportunity to confess to his brother that the father had been molesting him for 12 years. And that is what brought about the events of that week. I got very depressed and uh, I just had trouble concentrating in school. I just had trouble dealing with it. And I said, Dad, please, please stop. And I said, Dad, you're hurting me, and he just kept on going further. At one point, I just started screaming, and I started saying, stop, it hurts, it hurts. He was furious. If they truly fit the profile presented by the prosecution of hatred and greed, uh, they're pretty ugly human beings. They're pretty conscienceless human beings. They're people who are, in effect, sociopaths. Uh, even if they were exhibited or experienced some degree of abuse, the fact that they could still respond this way as opposed to a variety of other alternatives available to them suggests to me that they are retributive, vindictive people who are still sociopathic and dangerous. I suggest to you that if the abuse didn't occur or occurred in nowhere in the proportion that they described on the stands, then in addition to being complete sociopaths, they're also liars and perjurers, which sort of goes with the territory. I thought they were going ahead with their plan to kill us. And I, I realized that uh, they had been waiting for Eric to get home, like I had been. And I just freaked out. I met him at the top of the stairs. He hadn't gone in his room. And I remember f sort of being surprised by the fact that he was at the top of the stairs. And I said something to him along those lines that it's happening and they're gonna kill us. They admit to the first enormous lie, the 911, the mafia, possibly uh, another female involved. They admit to that. Then suddenly, oh yeah, 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 uh, we were molested as kids. Yeah, yeah, that's it too. I mean, if indeed they admit to one enormous lie, my mind boggles to think that a jury will swallow this enormous lie. And it's an ongoing lie, it's an ongoing lie. And it's been played out like a Shakespearean play, like a Shakespearean drama. And yet, tragedy about this all 
is that this tragic drama is making a comic opera of the whole court system. Now, logically, four years later, we can sit here and say, look, there's no way Jose and Kitty Menendez were going to kill their own sons. Uh, of course not. That's, that's a logical, rational point of view from four years later. However, on the night of August 20th, 1989, Eric and Lyle Menendez, in their minds, believed that their parents were going to kill them, and that is the legal question. Let me offer you an example. If the parents were knocking that evening at either or both of the boys' bedroom doors, open up, the boys might have a much better argument, certainly in my view, for arguing that they felt that their life was in danger. But quite the reverse was true. They were the aggressors against their parents at a point when the parents were presenting no danger to them. The last word on this case is this is a very tragic, sad story of a family that was out of control, a dysfunctional family that unfortunately different family members had seen warning signs, but nobody had ever sat down together and compared notes until the brothers were arrested and charged with killing their parents. And at that time, relatives realized uh, what a mess uh, they had in the Menendez family. This was a rampage of murder. You know what I mean? There's, you know, you can kill in one shot just as well as you can kill in 16 shots. And, uh, uh, you know, I've, hard, I've tried hard to picture in my mind what it must have been like. I mean, what it must have been like to be firing, you know, like this. And I wondered if there was you know, what they were saying at the time. I mean, this is what I'd like to know. Just the, the novelist in me wants to know this. I mean, what happened? I mean, were, were, they, were, they, were they screaming out hate or were they getting off on it? Or, I don't know that. We just burst through the doors and uh, I started firing. There was things shattering and the noise was phenomenal and um, we fired lots of, you know, many, many times. You reloaded? Is that yes? Yes. And what did you do after you reloaded? I ran around and shot my mom. I mean, I think it was very important in, in, in this trial that Eric Menendez had written a screenplay about a young man who kills his, parent, his, his parents for the money, for their wealth, and, and kills them with a 12-gauge shotgun, and that that was disallowed uh, to be brought up into, into the trial, I think is wrong. I mean, to, to me, that has to be the genesis of what this case is all about. This was in their minds. I'm sure that the retrial on the Menendez case will be lean and mean, as I would choose to call it, with respect to uh, how they're gonna pare down. I would, I would guess they're gonna go for one jury, try both brothers to one jury. They've admitted what they've done, and now they've come up with this pale Mickey Mouse mulligatawny soup of defense. We were molested as children. No one believes it. However, I think tragically for the system, we have a jury that has wavered. I mourn that. I mourn that. I celebrate the system, but I mourn the event. Who was the person that was shot? <laughs> my mom and my dad. Your mom and dad? My mom and my dad. <laughs> there would be another day in court for the Menendez brothers. At the retrial, a new jury listened to the tapes once again. But this time, the tears, the heartbreaking story, falls on deaf ears. Lyle and Eric Menendez are found guilty and sent to jail for life. <laughs>